This is the Tech on Toast podcast. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the next episode of the Tech on Toast podcast. And I'm delighted to be rejoined uh, today by Joel Sachi, co-founder of Umenu Now. And welcome Vikram Badwa. Have I got that right? You have, yep. Thank you very much. Director of International Retail Technology for Starbucks. That's a mouthful. It, it, <laughs> it is. That's it's, not uh, how you introduce yourself to people, is it? <laughs> I need to come up with an acronym. Yeah, I'm trying to think that. No, that doesn't, that doesn't sound good when you do that. So we won't do that. But anyway, welcome back, Joel. How are you? Very, very good. Thank you very much for having me. It's always good to be around you. You have this positive aura. Oh, that's nice. That, Thank uh, you. Apparently, I'm really loud, though, you were telling me today. Yeah, you've down, <laughs> so, no, and, and how's life, Joel? What have you been up to? Um, I'm going skiing today. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, he has like, a huge case in the corner here. <laughs> me and Vic are a bit sad looking yeah. at him where he's going, but uh, yeah. My kids kept me up all night, so I'm slightly delirious right now. So if I do say something a bit silly, okay. edit it out. That's why you were fiddling <laughs> with the coffee app, wasn't it, this yeah. morning, trying to get yourself fueled up. Uh, and Vic, how are you? I mean, I, we, we've met previously, LinkedIn, maybe yeah, a couple I've of been, video calls. I've been following these podcasts for a while, so I'm uh, delighted to be here. Really good. Um, busy with Starbucks, but... Um, and, and also helping Joel in my spare time. So, um, no, it's great. it's great to be here. <laughs> Joel has an army of helpers. He does. <laughs> I am very blessed to have him. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. <laughs> so, look, I, I suppose before we start, and I know you've been on before, uh, we didn't have the, ca- the cameras on you before, so now you, everyone can see your lovely face. Uh, should we just talk about your menu now a little bit and just talk about where you're up to in that journey? Because it, um, it was brilliant last time I met you with Greg, but kind of give bring us up to date. Yeah. Um, so, eMenu has... Well, we do three main things, and we have two principles. The three things we do is we help hospitality businesses boost sales, cut costs, and improve the customer experience. And the two principles that underpin that is, one is sustainability. Um, you could fill Wembley Stadium multiple times over with the amount of waste the hospitality sector <laughs> produces in the UK. Uh, we're talking about paper waste, food waste, advertising, point of sale, all of that. e you can really help reduce that waste um, and reuse your old hardware. Uh, to deliver the s- solutions you need to, to really succeed. And the second one is service. Um, you know, we did some research uh, recently, and we found out that around 80% of hospitality businesses are not happy with their tech providers. Uh, around 50% of them are really not happy with their tech <laughs> providers. And um, what was interesting about the research is that it's not that they want the best tech solution out there that integrates with everything and gives them the, 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 the best thing ever. They just want someone that's going to help them out in their time of need. Um, you know, when you're six deep at the bar and things aren't working, they don't want to go on a chatbot or talk to someone in a different country who's going to talk you through some troubleshooting documents. They want someone to just say, yes, I've got you. Give me a second. Here you go. It's sorted. Um, so as long as we can give really good service and promote sustainability whilst making people better businesses, helping them get better businesses uh, in a way of succeeding. Yeah, and it's interesting. Today, I was just saying to you, you guys at the table out there, I had a, a pub chain, very small, just two sites came to me this morning, and um, but in their eyes, not small, obviously, uh, came to me this morning talking about tech stack and talking about what they want to do. And it's interesting, Vic, isn't it, that, that micro... Um, issues that these guys are facing where they've got no integration or they've got, we, they were talking about, you know, getting payments from the table or orders from the table into the kitchen. From an enterprise level, I'm guessing it's it's still there, right, that problem, but it's a different fix. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I, look, I think everybody's struggling with similar problems. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting with sort of emerging players like eMenu now it, that, are, that are disrupting the industry um, is that you've got these... Uh, young, new players that are well backed, that have got open APIs, that are really focusing on a core offering that they're good at, their USP ultimately. Yeah. Versus the big incumbents that you know try to do everything and none of it that well, and they didn't play well with other partners too. So you end up in this kind of chicken and egg situation where you've got you know you're paying a lot of money for some tech. It's very difficult to integrate because it's a closed ecosystem with a third party. Versus now you know you can. You know, if we look at um, restaurant management systems as an example, you can get a best in breed uh, demand management system talking to a like small agile labor management solution and an inventory management solution rather than going for like an all singing, all dancing fourth or something like that that you would have historically needed to look at. So I think it's um, I think it's a great time to be a tech player in the hospitality space because I think there's a lot of interesting things happening, um, but there's a lot of tech debt. It needs to be unpacked. It's a great phrase. Like your, like your two, the the, yeah. the two, the two pub, the two pub chain that you talked about, and it's unpacking that that's the complex thing that everybody's struggling with. Yeah, and I think, um, and Joel, one of the things we were going to talk about is the eco pilot, right? Which is the, uh, I suppose your 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 version of helping fix that problem. Yeah, I mean, so, Vikram's been uh, instrumental in this. You know, we started off with e menu, so helping businesses um, 
access really beautiful digital menus that upsells based on the time of day, day of week, um, you know, have allergen filters and, and all that smart stuff, providing that to everybody. Right? It doesn't matter what point of sale you have, you have a 20 year old point of sale, you can still access that great tool. Um, but that's just helping the customer. How about the, the staff? The staff still are using this 20 year old tech that's just not providing that customer journey that most customers want. They still want to talk to a human being and be served and have the simple stuff. Be sat down, explain the menu, ask them, look, I've got this allergy. Can you tell me what I can and can't eat? What goes well with this dish? What wine would you recommend? All of those things aren't being done generally very well. Uh, so we developed EcoPilot to solve that. It is a co-pilot for your staff um, and is helping staff provide that customer journey. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, the ability to use, again, same sort of principles as eMenu. You can use any device, be it a phone or a tablet, anything connected to the internet, to take orders and payments and upsell. Uh, so imagine you walk around in a restaurant, someone says, hey, can I get an X? No worries. Oh, and it prompts you, well, with that, this goes really well. Uh, so it, it's promoting uh, the right thing at the right time for your staff. So imagine uh, you had a member of staff that was new to the business and didn't know the menu well enough. You just <laughs> Every day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's very common in the industry. Um, it ends up being a really nice training tool. Um, you know, that member of staff feels comfortable going around, explaining the menu, upselling. Uh, and we've got some really smart things we're doing there to incentivize that upselling. So um, you know, there are competitions within this. So if you sell the most X, you'll get Y. So as a member of staff, it be, you gamify the experience. It becomes quite interesting. Uh, you know, and, and also makes um, that whole environment an environment you want to be around because it's fun. It is really interesting because you have to get to a point in tech where you are servicing both parties equally. Yeah. You know, so obviously always the user experience is key and that intu intuitiveness. Every, most p people eating out now have grown up with an iPhone or yeah. in their hand or something. So they've been able to understand that journey. But equally, the staff have to be looked after. I listened this morning um, to a lady who had an allergen in Grind uh, and... Um, this isn't Grind's fault, but they had to go and call a manager to explain the process around allergens because they're making sure they're doing it right. Right, I get it totally, but that's like a four-minute wait. You know, depending, he's bless him is probably doing something else somewhere else, and he's getting dragged down here to have to have that conversation. So it's really interesting that we're still really not addressing those issues because that's that's time we're losing, right, in terms of efficiencies and everything else. And I'm sure Vic that when you look at this, I mean, because everybody can access tech now, right? It's it's become it's that's why I mean Vic said it was exciting. He's right, isn't it? Because it's it's so accessible and it's so it's so good what we can do with tech now. The problem is that <laughs> that's almost opened the gates, right? That there's there's a lot of people doing it. How how do you kind of manage that, Vic? How how does it become accessible but still revolutionise what we're trying to do? Yeah, look, I I, I think allergens is a is a great example. Yeah. and everybody's you know post Natasha's law, everybody's really trying to focus in on that. So we're. You know, we've got something where we've got a, a dynamic nutritional and allergen calculator that will tell you exactly what is in what you've customized with the hundreds of thousands of different possibilities that you can build a drink. And I think everybody is trying to tackle the same problems. I do think there's an opportunity for the industry to come together more um, because there's a lot of kind of independent, everybody's trying to hold on to their little secret thing and we're all trying to save the same problem. So there's so much waste um, in doing that. Um, but yeah, like, you know, uh, there are a number of players, especially, you know, at the startup, uh, at startup level that are really challenging. Um, and actually by the big players, you know, the big enterprise players, having an ecosystem where you can have both small and large vendors, I think you get the best of both worlds. You yeah. get the, your, the ability to scale, but also innovate on the edges, um, you know, is, is you know, what we're doing at Starbucks, but also historically at KFC and McDonald's, it gives you the ability to, to truly at an enterprise level move into new markets, but also um, test and learn and innovate using smaller players around the edges. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's the way that an enterprise scale with kind of tackling this. Yeah, I think and that, that's right, Joel. That because you, I think you said to me before, who's looking after the little guys, right? Uh, I think it's, I think it's totally right because the hostility is vast. Think of all the different verticals, competitive socialising, pubs, bars, hotels, restaurants, and not everybody can have everybody. <laughs> uh, but uh, but that's the space you're trying to fill, right? Really trying to help these guys kind of get over the fact that they might have tech debt is my new favourite phrase, Vic, which I've stolen forever. Uh, but to get over that tech debt and kind of maintain or, and be able to function still, access enterprise level tech, but in a SME scale. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it, it is for everyone. I mean, we 80% of the hospitality sector are small businesses. And um, you know, one of our one of our the first client actually on the EcoPilot product is a is a train company, 
uh, and, and the, the solutions they had were, you know, were very, very old. Uh, and, and now, you know, that a member of staff can walk down, uh, walk down the train and, you know, take orders and payments on the same device and have that go straight to the kitchen or the, the, the cafe where there's a kitchen display screen. It's just a web, web browser. It can be accessed on a phone or a tablet. It's made and it's delivered to the seat. It's so simple and it's accessible. It's not expensive. It plugs into anything. Um, so you can take this around the world. Anyone can run their business on, on a solution like Ecopilot. So I'm really happy to be supporting the businesses that are not really well supported in, in today's environment. Yeah, I, I find transport very interesting in tech. I think transport has been... Um, <laughs> unattended and trains particularly in the UK I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world but trains in the UK particularly the, the, the level of accessibility to tech or how we could function how we do in a, in a venue like today is totally different uh, and, and Vic the co integration and cost is expensive right depending on what you're doing as you mentioned you've, yeah. you've a big partner small partner is there a way around that now are working with these smaller guys enabling you to do more with less if that makes sense yeah look I think um standardized connectors, standardized APIs, and actually vendors really creating a win-win partner ecosystem, um, I think is happening more and more. Yeah. And um, that does enable smaller and bigger operators to come to the table and stitch these best of breed solutions together in a way that where the tech just works, right? And that's always been, you know, big enterprise brands like Starbucks have large tech teams that can support this stuff but the small players don't. And um, actually, you know, making it so that systems can talk, um, you know, can talk to each other, I think is, I think we're, we're now at a stage where that has really matured. And there's a, um, you know, there's a good suite of offerings out there that, you know, ultimately can start to face into some of these challenges that we're talking about, where we really are facilitating, like the crew experience and the customer experience and thinking about both angles, um, rather than just, you know, because you can't replace old school hospitality, right? And that's the that's the one challenge. It's like in COVID, everybody thought we were going to pivot to 100% digital ordering, and that hasn't quite happened. People still want to walk up to the front counter and talk to somebody and interact, um, and that's that's the nature of the business, right? Yeah, and I think and it's frustrating, right? Because the QR code made its comeback a bit like Madonna, you know, kept <laughs> came back in the pandemic. Everyone thought, wow, it's back. This is great. But and then when you try and go and order sometimes one of these things. You're disappointed, right? And we, me and Joel went through this, not not here today, but we were somewhere else today, and we, we went through this process of ordering, and it was just like, wow, I don't want to give you my life story. I don't want to spend seven minutes ordering when I can literally go to the bar, which is right behind me, and do it there. So it's still not perfect, is it? And I'm sure it's a long road, but I think it's a lot. there's a lot more options out there, and I think that's where you fit in, right? You're trying to get this, you're trying to sit in that part and say, look, we can do this quick, nimble, on old tech, and get you through the process and not have to worry about sending you mad <laughs> as Joel was this morning. Yeah. I don't know if that's a habit of yours, Joel, everywhere you go, testing I will the... make sure I get yeah. the order through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a yeah, it was it was a challenging experience, but it's also good to see that look, um, these solutions are everywhere and there's loads of room for improvement, which is uh, you know, you would think a couple of years down the line everyone has a great solution. Not the case. No, it's still on version one or version two. There's it really is, but 10 now. the opportunity is huge. I yeah. think that's the main thing, isn't it? The opportunity is huge. And what's really interesting about you guys, and I've got a call this afternoon with um, talking about um, the Guinness stores for a customer. We're putting some guest experience tech in there, and um, you guys have done something quite different, haven't you? Got a collaboration with a, a major supplier, drink yeah. supplier, yeah. to enable you to reach more people, actually. But actually, again, you're fixing a problem. Tell us more about it because it is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, so. There's two angles here. One is around sustainability, and the other is around accessibility for um, for this sort of tech for, yeah. for the mass market, right? Because it can be too expensive. It's just too much friction. No one likes any change, uh, and no one wants to spend any money today. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you want everything for nothing, right? How can you do it? Well, we found a way to do it. Um, big food and drinks brands want you to buy more of their product. They can do that today on Google, on Amazon. They can say, "Hey, Coca-Cola, for example," right? Yeah. Type in Coke, Coca Cola will be the first thing that pops up on Google. If you type in Coke in Amazon, he's going to get a big Coke banner with videos and all that sort of stuff. It's going to make you want to buy Coke. Um, but you can't really do that in hospitality uh, and not well and not scalably. Uh, if you think about what big food and beverage brands do today, they go and they train members of staff saying, hey, look, you should upsell this gin and this is what you can do with the cocktails. You know, please put the, our point of sale materials on these tables explaining all the new innovation brands we've got. Please put this massive banner outside explaining X, Y, and Z. I mean, most of this stuff goes straight in the bin. 
and staff move on and they forget about all these upsells. So you know, there's millions and millions of pounds being wasted uh, by big food and beverage brands where they cannot get people to purchase their brands. So with eMenu, uh, we've partnered with, with some, some big brands to promote their products, which are already in the venue, ahead of others, increasing sales, um, and subsidize the cost of eMenu for customers. Uh, and we, we did a trial in December and in January with, with multiple sites. And for one gin brand, uh, the, the brand that was being promoted, uh, the unit sales for those went up 158% versus the wow. same time last year. And it was just digital promotions. So, you know, this thing works. Uh, so I, I, I think we may be one of the first to do it um, with such a big brand. And uh, I think we'll, you'll see more of this in the future. Definitely after this goes up. <laughs> so, but it's like, I mean, someone once said to me, Vic, it's like a billboard in your hand, right? Having that digital weapon, as it would be, in your hand. Like you've got that ability to do that right for people and to do that for partners. Is it something, I mean, it's because I know you're working with Joel on this, but is, is, do you think that's a scalable, do you think people will follow? Yeah, look, I think um, going back to the point about nobody wants to spend any money, yeah. right? You know, the UK is technically in a recession at the moment. People are going out, eating less, drinking less. Um, you know, and so if, when I think about like the franchisee or, or even an indivi in, a individual operator, the cost of tech is just mounting, right? There's some analysis done by Gartner over the course of the last two years that shows like the increase in tech spend for retailers. And the industry sort of, um, the industry is uh, tracking higher than, than other industries. And that's because of all of the disruption that's happening, right? And so I think what's, we ultimately have to work out how we make this more sustainable going forward. And I love the idea of subs like subsidizing some of the costs yeah. around it. You know, the, the, the value, a lot of brands don't truly appreciate the value of the data that's being captured, as well as the upsell opportunity around, you know, marketing, right? But, but the value of the customer data, preferences, what sells what with what, um, you know, I think it's incredibly valuable and can be monetized to help ultimately make everything cheaper so that the whole thing becomes more sustainable. And as you, you, you end up with that single customer view, right? So you end up, that data that you're gathering from drinking, or, or drink, drinks ordering or food ordering, whatever it might be, you end up with that single customer view, which is, which is what the power of what you're talking about, where you can literally say, Chris visited uh, the plow in Harborne in Birmingham and, and drank this and ate that and comes in regularly, weirdly, on a Wednesday, right? So then you start understanding, oh, that must be his day where he worked, you know. So it becomes so powerful in terms of what you can do after that with people. And, and is that data then very accessible to your end user? Yeah, so it, it depends on, uh, when you say end user, do you mean the, the brand or the, yeah. the restaurant? Yeah, the or restaurant. Both. Or both. Um, but I, I think we, we can talk about data now, I guess. You know, the, the fact is that there's just a lot of data right now available to hospitality businesses. And um, I think the stat is, Stats is around 50% of hospitality businesses don't use their data for sure um, at all, <laughs> um, and they struggle um, mainly because it's it's complex, right? They're not data scientists, yeah. right? they're not tech businesses, they're hospitality businesses. But you've got all this data. How do you turn that into insights? And and you know w when you're struggling to do the basics, uh, you know the data is normally secondary. Uh, so you know we think there, there's there are two ways that we, we generally help. One is we can help you monetize that data first. So do nothing with it. Let's let's get someone to pay for that data yeah. and then subsidize some of your services, or if not, make it a revenue generation tool for you. Um, multiple businesses will want access to that data to know. Oh, my brand is actually fourth on the gin list. Yeah. Uh, in terms of profit, in terms of um, sales, how do I get that to number one? Um, I will pay you to get it to number one. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll sponsor your digital menu. I'll sponsor your point of sale. I'll I'll inf I'll run competitions on your point yeah, of sale. Yeah, put so product that, in the venue, yeah, yeah whatever, exactly. yeah. And, and, and weirdly, I was talking to Brendan from JKS, who's the head of projects there, JKS Restaurants, and he was talking about the infrastructure and the setup of head offices of these mid-chains, um, and that actually we've got the wrong roles in these head offices that we, from what you're talking about, Vic, about the change in, you know, the disruption that's going on in terms of tech, that actually, and for data analysis and for change management and all that kind of stuff, is there a position where we should be looking at a slightly different look of a hospitality company in terms of the way they manage everything, the output that's coming out. Now, it's a bit radical, I know. Everyone wants an area manager, everyone wants a CFO and all that kind of stuff. But I genuinely believe that those roles will exist in the next, well, should now, to, to manage data, manage. Because in, in an enterprise level, I'm guessing you have people, right, that look after that stuff, that make sure that that's happening. Yeah, I, I have a, a peer that is responsible for data and orchestration. Right. Um, and the team... 
uh, has a dedicated team. And then within the US, we have a, a team of data scientists that are building out models for recommendations, but looking at rewards data and targeted marketing. There is so much value in, in all of this, right? But that's, you know, Starbucks is a big enterprise yeah. brand, as is Yum, as is McDonald's, and, and not, you know, your, your chain of two pubs yeah. can't afford to make that happen. So how do you ultimately give them insight um, you know, in their hands so that they can action. And that's the kind of, you know, I think that's what's really interesting about this. The, at an enterprise level, the, the big brands are going to want to keep hold of this data. It's a point of differentiation versus at a smaller scale, um, there's less you can do with it at the moment. Right? Yeah. And that's where I think eMenu now actually can really, uh, can, can really provide some value. But, but I think you're right. You know, ultimately, even the medium-sized businesses really need to start thinking about data analysis. How does that, you know, data-led decisions, how does all of this really shape how you operate? Because you, you could argue, potentially, that having a data analyst in your head office could replace or redeploy labor from the front line because you know where the sales are going or you know where you need to be. And I think that's really interesting looking at it from a helicopter view going, actually, we know that Tuesdays or whatever, all through the year, We've got too many people hanging around doing not a lot, but we know that on Wednesday, Thursdays, actually, due to our data analyst who's paid X amount a year, has told us that we need to do this. And that value is huge, right? Because there's a lot. I think you talked about Wembley Stadium being full of wasted stuff from hospitality. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally, I think, I, and, I, and, and that's from my gut, you know, and I have spent years working off my gut in hospitality. And I think it's really interesting now that finally, we have a picture painted of what we're doing through products like yours, where we can see what's happening, but we need to act on it. You know, we need to enact it. And uh, I, th I think it's exciting. You mentioned insight at the start, actually, Joel, around um, uh, tech adoption, tech usage. Um, and I suppose we've talked about a little bit, actually, about how you're kind of counteracting that and how you're helping improve some of those problems. But some of those stats were huge, right? About, um, was it 50% you said weren't entirely happy with their POS provider? Yeah, so 80% are not very happy. 50% um, <laughs> are really not happy. <laughs> right, okay. so, so it's, it's almost the other one just didn't bother. They were yeah. so angry, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so they just want better support. They just want simpler, accessible tools. Um, and if you can get it for free, fantastic. And do you think the dominance of the big guys, right? So like, and we're not, they know who they are. Yeah. So we're not gonna name them, but like the, the, the biggest um, suppliers in, in, the, in your space, I suppose. Do you think that that's going, I mean, I personally, from the marketplace, see it being challenged yeah. because the amount of people that come into me with new solutions and what they're doing and very lightweight, nimble tech, agile tech. Do you think that's going to challenge? I mean, it's both of you this actually. Do you think that's going to challenge over the next couple of years? Um, I, I can give you an example from Friday, actually. I, I went to pitch um, to a, a nightclub and um, the person leaving was someone with a startup point of sale system. Uh, and the point of sale they had in place had been there for about 10 years. And I asked them, well, why are you considering this business that had just started? Yeah. They said, because it's all new tech. It's all stuff that I've not seen before, and I'm talking directly to the founder. But you could also go to X, Y, and Z company that have been here for 15 years, and yeah. best in class, that, you know, there's some great companies out there, and it's like, no, I, I want to talk to someone, I want to have that personal experience, and the fact that it, it's just so nimble means that I'm, I'm, get, I'm ready to get rid of, I mean, they have tons of screens, it's a huge nightclub, but they're gonna go for this tiny startup business. I think that this disruption is happening. I'm seeing it at the smaller end, how about at the bigger end? Yeah, look, I, I think, um it, it definitely is happening. I think the smaller players that can be, that will do anything to win the business, that don't have like this legacy technology mm. that they're kind of, that, that is holding them back, which a lot of the, the big players have, means that ultimately they can be much more agile to your point, right? And I do think that is, you know, you look at Square that entered the market that can ship a pause in a box and you can self-serve and configure it yourself and you're up and running in a day. How do, you know, one of the bigger players, you know, you're talking about a significant financial um, expense to get the thing set up and then running. And so I think, you know, ultimately everybody's going to try to pivot into this more agile, leaner um, way of working. I, I've got a friend who runs a dark kitchen in Cardiff. He's got about 14 brands that go out. He does really well. He's still about 50 grand a week, you know, from nothing, you know, and he has an events business as well now. So he's doing summer events with his little, he has a truck he's invested in. He's out. So he's, he's really killing it. And he's off to Ireland to do a franchise. But, and I asked him the other day about pause because I was saying to him, oh, look, you're still on, I think he's on Zettel. Uh, oh, he's on. Yeah. And I said, I said, you're going to change. He went, no. Yeah. I said, why not? He said, I don't need to. It's, 
perfect for what I do. It's an, and it was just really, and I said, oh, but you can have this. And I was showing him all my wares in the marketplace, going, you can have anything. Because I'm just interested to get his feedback all the time. And he's like, I just don't need to. I said, I, I don't have time to invest in a big piece of kit coming into my business that is going to probably distract me and probably deliver the same thing they've already got. And he said, I, and I'm just happy with the level of report and I got. I'm happy with the functionality. And that's it. It's just, I find it absolutely, um, I, I find it really interesting talking to these people on the ground who think totally different to the people selling in. Yes. Uh, because as you said before, they're not, uh, the, the, the feeling that everyone wants everything perfectly integrated, it's actually not true. Uh, yes, they don't want things. They, they don't look at it as integrated. They look at it as operations working properly. So it's very, it's a very different mindset. And they they approach it from like, when it's a problem, it's a problem. I changed pause in my one of my old companies on the one day. They, someone rang me on the day that it broke, that something happened that really peed me off. And I went into an RFP because of that day. <laughs> That's how emotional I was. So it's, it's the service. Right? Yeah, it's a, better service. Yeah, it was about... Broke, you would have... Yeah, and, well, no, yeah, I won't even tell you it was, but it was yeah. shocking. <laughs> uh, but it, it pause particularly is interesting, right? And the future of pause and where it might get to. And I think we were kind of alluding to it a little bit already as we're talking about nim being nimble and agile. Mm -hmm. Where do we, do we think we're going to have a world where there is no mother till and there is no, uh, you know, there is no kind of um, physical, because we used to build restaurants based on pause in Carluccio's. We would design and build them based on this till has to be here, the mother till was there, this is the station for the kids to stand up and queue up and put their orders in, you know, and that's physically how we built restaurants. So yeah, what do you think about the future of pause? The mother till, that's a new term. <laughs> Have you never heard that? Maybe that's an operator term. <laughs> I've never heard of the where, where is the mother till? Really? It's like pause one. I'll show you where it's the mother till is. Pause one, like the mother till. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, look, I think, I think it's really interesting, right? I think, you know, especially in the QSR space, um, like in, within fast food, everybody is sort of pushing to try and be 100% digital. They're yeah. pushing you to the app, they're pushing you to progressive web, or they're pushing you to kiosk. Even in drive through, there's a load of interesting stuff happening with voice AI to, to automate order taking. And so POS is losing relevance. I think that's undeniable. Um, but then within premium concepts, you still have this rub where people expect to be served by somebody. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's where Copilot's actually a really interesting solution because it sort of blends both and you still get that human interaction and you're supporting, supporting the partner journey as well. So I, I do think POS will have a place. Um, Personally, I think what we're going to see happening is a number, like the bigger players will pivot into two, well, three areas, actually. One, one's around this whole space around aggregators of aggregators, like the likes of Deliverect, where yep. you're paying a fee to plug in third-party orders to your legacy POS. I think the big incumbents will just do build out direct connections and capture. Well, it's already happening, right? Yeah, the, and, a lot and, of them are already trying to do that or doing that. And capture that value, ultimately. Um, and then actually, you know, I think the one thing that is an extension of pause that actually is incredibly important is kitchen production. And so, you know, it's always been like, um, like thought, or, thought about as like just a, a kind of add on. But actually, I think the, the production engine, you know, whether it's labeling kitchen screens, you know, the sequencing of orders, um, you know, now that we're moving to a increasingly digital world with all of these orders coming from your app, delivery aggregators, the way in which that's produced, tracked, exposed to the outside world through events is becoming increasingly important and actually a point of differentiation in my opinion. So I think actually that's a space where there are some dedicated players out in the industry like QSR Automations that do kitchen management, but I think actually, and then you've got the likes of Deliverect helping with the order aggregation and the connection back up to delivery, I think the POS vendor is gonna lean more heavily into that and then a place that's relatively you know, easy for them to also step into is payment, right? And then, you know, because you ultimately can get a percentage of each of the transactions and it's an easy way to make money, right? Yeah, it and really so, is. And, and that, as we're seeing it now, is a race, right? To the, uh, I don't want to say the bottom, but there's, a, <laughs> there's, but there's definitely a race, right? Because you, you, we, we don't have to mention them again, but there's three or four incumbents I can think of who are doing that, who've switched that. And customers are almost beholden to, you know, if they're already with the pause, they're kind of, taking the payment and on we go and you know and there's and there's good arguments to do that right again it cuts out part of your stack it cuts out another person you're talking about but I, I i really want to create some content around the payment structure of a payment and hospitality i'm going to do it i'm where you have your fee and then you have all these hidden fees that sit behind it where smaller mid mid-size operators don't know what they're paying they think yeah. they know uh, but if you i did an exercise with prime minister with my cfo and we spent the summer and it was the summer, because we didn't sell any pies in the summer, uh, looking at our payment structure and what we paid to WorldPay 
at the time. And we just had so many hidden, you know, you've got rentals for machines, you've got the actual percentage of the commission, you've got um, paying for someone in, to have seven managers in a, an office in Southwark. You've got, so you've got, you've got a, there's a lot of hidden costs there. And actually, it's a really aggressive part of your strategy to go and look at your payment provider and look at what you're paying, because I think there's a real win there if you can get it right and find that. In, and also in terms of connectivity and what you're doing and all the other bits. But yeah, it, it's interesting I'm working a lot with Dojo and those kind of guys at the moment, just seeing what, and that, that market seems to be getting really competitive. Uh, which is exciting because normally that brings hopefully better tech better opportunity for the operators what do you think Joel obviously you're going to say a co-pilot is the future of pause Chris uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just say it uh, but um, what do you because what, you're, you're already on this mission I think you already had this in your mind I've known you for three or four years now you were kind of thinking this a long time ago there's just so much going on in, in the pause space um, personally when I when I pitch to customers they want more and more and more uh, so we grow with them and I can see why the why well, you've got these behemoths of, of pauses because I'm assuming they've gone through that journey over the last 20 years. Like, oh, can you add this on? Can you add the kitchen display? Can you add detail stock manager? Can you add this, this, and this? And then what is the definition of a pause? Is it all of those things or is it some of those things? Um, so you know, we're going through that journey where we're trying to figure out what is the minimum product that most businesses want and really need. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and part of that is around you know, kitchen displays, uh, the ability to take orders and payments and do that w without the complexity, as you mentioned, with uh, WorldPay, they're one of our partners, and a good company to work with. Uh, one of the benefits of working with a company like WorldPay is because they'll also promote your business. Yep. We work with the Mini now, and then they'll, you know, this lead generation and all that sort of stuff. But naturally, that, that payment journey is, is quite complex. But if you can simplify that and say, actually, you don't need to have five card terminals that you're paying 20 quid a month for uh, and all this sort of stuff, and it breaks and it falls out of your pocket, uh, but actually, you could use any device to take a payment. That completely changes it, and it simplifies the costs as well. So I think um, the future of POS, in my view, is just simplifying everything um, and, and breaking down um, the barriers of understanding what are you actually going to get out of this. We me we mentioned data briefly, and I just wanted to come back to that really about because um, what what you're getting from me menu now, if I understand rightly, is transactional data. Where you were talking about before about you know the fact that you can see what's going on with the alcohol suppliers, you can see what's going on with food ordering, and that transactional information is I suppose the oxygen now for operators, or if they use it. <laughs> if they use it, yeah. So for, for us, we so the, the two things: one, we can monetize it, which is great, and then the second thing is we help our operators, like you mentioned, you know. Most operators don't have head office with some of data analysts yeah. helping them. So we'd help them say, okay, look, these are the things you should potentially be selling on your e menu our service. Of course, we want people to use it more. Uh, on your eco-pilot, these are the things that you should be promoting at these certain times. So, um, yeah, that insight from suppliers like like us is, is so valuable to, to, to small to medium-sized businesses. And how do you deliver it? Or is it part of the, literally, they've got a report they can so pull off? For us, again, because it's all about the service, we have very regular check-ins with the key stakeholders and all of our businesses. And as part of that, it's okay, should we go through your sales? Should we go through what was the best selling, the worst selling, and what could you do different for the next period until our next check-in? Uh, and we help them structure their menu. It's um, it's something that's helped us. It's worth the investment for, for me as a business because it helps with the uh, the retention of those customers. Because even if, you know, that. They'll tell you if they're not happy in those meetings. Oh, they yeah. just won't tell you. Yeah, <laughs> that's a problem. Yeah, it's always a problem when they're quiet, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Like me with my pause that day. The only day it was a, it was only a problem on that day, and that's the day that I made the decision. So it's really in and then back over to the I suppose looking at the enterprise level for data. And we talked about data analysts all this kind of stuff, but actually the real value of this data is is it just through transactional? Is it also understanding where they're spending? I suppose it transactional covers where they're spending, what they're spending. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think so. But it's also, um, you know, can you start to force, not necessarily force, but can you start to encourage customers to come in at times when they're not coming in? Yes. Right. So starting to look across your customer base, identify patterns and then work out, OK, you know, and starting to categorize your customers into groupings and then target. Um, I think there is immense value in that. Right. So, so whether that's targeted promotions and this then is where you get to the next stage of it's not just transactional data, it's now we have a way of um, identifying you as a customer, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we need any of your personal data, but it's the type of customer you are, and you like a particular drink, and you like a particular food item, and you come in on these days, but people like you also buy things like this, and now we can get very specific about how we email market to you, or market to you through the app, or, you know, and actually that does drive repeat visits. And I think that's where there's a lot of value, right? So when you when you start to think about how you can ladder in 
a reward journey and the wealth of data that you have on that individual to make their experience better. Um, one, I think you build affinity to the brand, but also the ability you know, to, to drive up transaction value or repeat visits. Yeah, and, I think, and that loyalty piece, and we, the other day we did a bit of analysis on what people were typing into the front end of the, the website on Tech on Toast, and loyalty has gone from, I think, number nine in terms of ranking up to number three oh. over the past three months, and it just shows that, um, which tells you we're in a recession also, <laughs> in a really weird way, because it actually says that they're trying to hold, it's the golden goose is keeping that customer, right? Very hard, very easy to lose one, very hard to gain one. And I think um, that loyalty piece is becoming more and more important, and I think it's fractured around the customer journey. So I think that... If you have drive through, it might work great there, but it might not work great on premise or off premise or whatever it might be. And I think, and we were talking about um, friend and tech before who, who would do that really well in terms of that whole omni-channel view. And I think, I think loyalty is—is is, is it something you, do you plug into some of loyalty, or do you also help with that? Yeah, well, um, there are there are companies we plug into, and we have a very simple loyalty program. Right. Um, now, loyalty isn't necessarily a, an app. It's it's someone feel comfortable coming back to your brand, right? It's exactly that. <laughs> You've been listening to the podcast, my friend. <laughs> no, that's from Rock of 40 Hotels on the other week. And he said exactly the same. He said, loyalty, you can't fix it by buying yeah, something true. off the shelf. You've got to have loyalty to be able to encourage it. And the, the enablement of the tech will do that. Exactly. So we focus on the simple stuff. Make sure you have a really good service and your customers have a great experience. They will naturally become loyal and you can reward them for that. And they don't need anything fancy with loads of points that you can claim X from. It's just a little thank you. And that's what it is. You don't have to go down the whole crazy discounting world, which will damage your brand. Um, you know, you just, just say thank you to the customers that want to come and see you. Love that. Uh, and look, I mean, we've, we're going to run out of time, as you always we do on this bloody thing. Uh, but what about the future? I mean, you're sitting in a chair over there, Vic, and you've obviously come from huge brands over the years, and you're still in a huge brand. What does it look like, I suppose? you. I mean, you were showing us some stuff we won't talk about, because I'm sure you're not allowed. But we were looking at some stuff on your laptop before we come in, talking about some exciting stuff you're working on. Where is the, is there an end point, or is this going to keep iterating, keep changing in terms of, I suppose, in terms of EPOS and in terms of other tech we can get our hands on? Look, I, I, uh, yes, I think it is going to continue to iterate. I, you know, we were talking about order at table before and how there's so much opportunity in that space. We're on version one or version two, where's that going to go to? Progressive web. Um, you know, so so I think ultimately, for me, it's about giving customers choice. If you want to uh, to transact with a brand in any way that they want to transact with a brand, so if you want to use an app or you want to use web or you want to go to a kiosk or you want to talk to somebody, how can you facilitate all of those um, occasions and do them well? And at the same time, from a partner perspective, and this is something that we're really thinking about because you know your your crew sentiment. Um, and ensuring that your brand is a better place to work than the restaurant next door is so important because it's just becoming so competitive, one to hire, but also to retain talent. Yeah. Um, and that's an area where we're really doubling down. So part of that's in the ordering space, but also production, but also all of the back of house stuff. Like how do you schedule labor? Are you fairly allocating labor? Um, you know, do you enable staff to swap shifts and all of that kind of stuff and give them that level of flexibility? the tip sharing stuff that's, you know, um, I don't know, we talked about tip job before, but there are a lot of great solutions out there, but ultimately really just thinking through, give the consumer choice and reward loyalty, but also enable your crew to give the best experience that they properly can, that, that they can and become loyal to your brand. And I think tech can help make um, crew members' lives easier. And we have just, especially in response to COVID, we just laddered in a lot of complexity through mm -hmm. tech into stores. And we're now having to go back and clean that up because it's just become an increasingly difficult place to work and operate. Yeah, and I was talking to um, a lovely man called Nico who runs, uh, who's the COO at Paris Baguette. And uh, we were talking and he has something called a tech deck. Uh, and it's the first time I've seen something like that. I'm sure people have it digitally in bigger, in bigger companies, but uh, it was great. It's basically a little folder and he has all his different uh, tech partners in there. And everybody who onboards into the business team member gets to go through the tech deck. Um, so you can have that in replace of tech deck. I'll give you that one. Uh, tech, uh, deck. <laughs> tech deck. But, I just, but that just shows, right? I know it's a very manual example. It just shows where the industry's going. It shows that actually on the front foot, if you're going to be a good employer and you, you're very aware that those chefs that worked next door six months ago, they expected the same level of tech that they got in their last business, right? And they'll be able to kind of, because I, I totally agree. I think retention will be based a lot around how easy their job is or how, or how hard we're making it. Uh, but eMenu now is built on doing that, right? That's why you built it, to make these people's lives easier. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're talking about small companies really improving the 
the experience for um, not just customers but also staff and improving that loyalty. And there's some great small businesses that I work with. Um, you know, I think you brought Amble here before. Yeah. Uh, and Yuda. Uh, you know, they're, they're great businesses that are bringing new customers in and helping staff onboard faster. And then you have eMenu help, helping with that whole guest experience. Um, I mean, it's really exciting for an hospitality business to, to be going out there, going on tech on toes, going on the marketplace and, and, and seeing all these great solutions that are now becoming more and more affordable because of things like supplier sponsorship and all that. And having you as the guru to go to, to, to say, uh, <laughs> I'll take guru. Which, which I'll have that I today. <laughs> it's Thursday. Guru's going in my back pocket. Uh, but that's no, no. And I, I, I also think, and the reason I built it was to do with operations. That's, you know, that's my background. And yeah. obviously, I'm not as technical as either of you guys. Uh, but um, what is really interesting is the way that operations is being now represented or thought of. I'm sure it always was. But I think the more we can expose that, the more we can talk about the issues they're going through, and the more we can talk about the capability of tech to fix those problems, it becomes much more interesting. Look, I, I, I love chatting to you. It's pretty nice to have you on, Vic. Uh, we've been LinkedIn Thanks, friends for a while. So um, t- uh, if people want to get hold of eMenu now and uh, talk about EcoPilot, how do I say EcoPilot or EcoPilot? It almost sounds like you're an eco-warrior. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but how do people get hold of you, Joel? Um, it's, please just go on our website and uh, go on the contact us form. Um, if you're a hospitality business that wants to improve sales, cut costs, and improve the customer experience, let's have a chat. If you're a supplier that wants to get in front of your customers and promote your brand, let's get in ch- touch as well. Perfect. Lovely. And uh, they're also uh, e-menu now, obviously, on the marketplace, so you can go on there and find them, and you'll be able to find this podcast on there. And Vic, if people listen to your uh, dulcet tones and they think, oh, I'd like to chat to that clever man, um, can they get hold of you? What's the best way to send people to you? Search for me on LinkedIn. <laughs> yes. We'll connect through that. It's, it's always a safe way. way. It's, always, it's, a safe, it's a safe way. <laughs> Email is not good. Someone gave out their mobile once. I thought that was brave. Uh, but yeah. I think about, did you give out your mobile, Joel, first time around? Maybe. Round? I was very keen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Really? Yeah. <laughs> couple of desperate people ringing him up but yeah it's great anyway look thanks very much that's tech on toast podcast uh you've listened to e-menu now and we'll see you all soon thank you cheers thanks.